Hi, I'm Bob Lazar. During late 1988 and early 89, I worked on the propulsion systems of extraterrestrial vehicles for the United States government. The hardware and technology I was exposed to should be placed in the proper hands of the scientific community, and it is the right of every person on Earth to know that there is physical evidence which proves that there is life elsewhere and that at least one form of that life has been here. For those of you whose information about me is limited to this video, I'll give you a brief background. I'm a physicist. I have degrees in physics and electronics technology. I've worked in a number of scientific programs, some of which require top secret and above top secret security clearances, of which the most easily verifiable is my early 1980s job here at the Los Alamos Maison Physics Facility in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Between December of 88 and April of 89, I worked as a senior staff physicist in what has to be the most secret project in history. My place of work was a facility at an area known as S-4 on the Nellis Air Force Range in central Nevada. Area S-4 is located approximately 15 miles south of the infamous Area 51 installation at Groom Lake, where the U-2 and SR-71 spy planes were developed. For the duration of my employment at S-4, I was paid by the United States Navy. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to segregate the information contained here into two separate parts. The first part will deal with information with which I've had hands-on experience and personal instruction. In other words, not only did I read briefings and not only was I taught the theories of these technologies, but they were demonstrated for me and I know they are true and accurate. Some of the points covered in this first section will be how vast distances of space are traveled by virtue of an intense gravitational field, how this gravitational field is generated, what the power source is and how it functions, and general information about disks and the project at S4. The second part of this will deal with subjects on which I've read supporting information, yet for the most part, I had no other way to corroborate the information or ascertain its accuracy. When we get to part two, it'll be obvious why proof of some of this information could not be conclusive. Some of the points covered in the second section will be information about the beings that brought us this technology and how these beings have historically interacted with man. I've been prudent in selecting what to expose here and I think that some of this information should not be made available to the general public. This information is being conveyed to you as it was to me with the exception that in most cases I've simplified things for those of you with non-scientific and non-technological backgrounds. So let's begin. At the beginning of this first section, I'm going to give you three short science lessons, and once you've learned them, you'll not only know more about interstellar travel than almost anyone else in the world, but you'll know the actual method another civilization has used to travel from another star system to the planet Earth. Now, during the course of this, I'm going to have to relate information that I've learned at S4 to information that we're already aware of. And when I say we, I mean the general mainstream scientific community. So it's not to waste too much time explaining established scientific facts and theories. When I say we know this or we know that, please feel free to consult any qualified scientist, professor, or science teacher to have them explain my statements to you. One of the most predominantly asked questions is, how is it possible to cross vast expanses of space without exceeding the speed of light? Or how can you travel in reasonable time and economy between points that are light years apart? Now keep in mind that the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second, which translates into roughly 669 million miles an hour. And a light year is a distance traveled in one year at the speed of light. Proxima Centauri, which is the star system nearest ours, would take four years to reach traveling at the speed of light. So up until now, when we've examined the requirements to travel these distances, we've always had to consider the problems of traveling at a speed near the speed of light. This poses problems with propulsion, navigation, fuel capacities, and even when you consider the effects of acceleration on space-time, which include time dilation, mass increase, length contraction, and a whole host of other things, it quickly becomes evident that this type of travel would require a level of technology that man has not yet achieved. The truth of the matter is that traveling these distances does require a level of technology that man has not yet achieved. 
but it has nothing to do with flying in a linear mode near the speed of light. We know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, so in our universe we've always assumed that the fastest way from point A to B was to travel in a straight line at the speed of light. Well, the fact is that when you're dealing with space-time and you enjoy the capability of generating an intense gravitational field, the fastest way from point A to B is to distort or warp or bend the space-time between point A and B, bringing point A and B closer together. The more intense the gravitational field, the greater the distortion of space-time and the shorter the distance between points A and B. Most of us think of space-time as the void or as nothing. And remember, it wasn't that long ago that man considered the air in our atmosphere to be nothing. Yet with time, we've become aware of the elements and properties of the air in our atmosphere. Well, indeed, space-time is an entity, and one of its properties is that it can be distorted or bent by a gravitational field. We know that gravity bends or distorts space-time and light by virtue of the fact that we're able to see stars which we know should be blocked from our view by the sun. Referring to the graphic here, the solid line denotes the position of a star that's located behind the sun, and the dotted line shows its position as viewed from Earth. This is made possible because the sun's gravitational field distorts the space, time, and light around the sun, allowing us to view stars which should be hidden from view. We know that gravity distorts time by virtue of the fact that if we take two identical atomic clocks and keep one at sea level and take the other one up to a high altitude, when we bring them both back together, they reflect different times. The difference in this passage of time is caused by the fact that a gravitational field weakens the further you get from the source. So the atomic clock which was taken to the high altitude was exposed to a less powerful gravitational field than the clock which we kept at sea level. The effect of a gravitational field on space-time is something that we've been able to observe but not to experiment with. This is due to our inability to generate a gravitational field. And up until this point in time, great mass such as a star, planet, or moon was the only source of a discernible gravitational field that we're aware of. So just as the gravitational field around great mass such as a planet distorts space and time, any gravitational field, whether naturally occurring or generated, distorts space and time in a similar manner. Now the great benefit of generating an intense gravitational field is not only can you turn it on, but you can turn it off. If we refer back to our original illustration of space-time distortion, we can see that when we generate an intense gravitational field, we can distort the space-time and in turn the distance between the point where we are and the point where we want to be. We can then position ourselves at the point where we want to be and then stop generating the gravitational field, allowing space-time to return to its natural form. In this manner, we can travel great distances with little linear movement and this is how space-time distortion translates into reduced distance. Now back to our original question, how is it possible to cross the vast expanses of space required for interstellar travel without exceeding the speed of light? This is accomplished by generating an intense gravitational field, distorting space-time and allowing you to cross many light years of space in little or no time and without traveling in a linear mode near the speed of light. The next question is, how do you generate a gravitational field? Up until this point in time, I've used the term generate to describe the capability of producing a gravitational field, but since I'm not aware of any way of creating a gravitational field from nothing, a more accurate term might be to access and amplify a gravitational field. And this is what I mean when I use the term generate. To understand how gravity is generated or accessed and amplified, you must first know what gravity is. There are two main theories the wave theory which states that gravity is a wave, and the currently accepted theory of gravitons, which are alleged subatomic particles that perform as, as gravity, which is total nonsense. Well, gravity is a wave, and there are two specific different types of gravity, gravity A and gravity B. Gravity A works on a smaller micro scale, while gravity B works on a larger macro scale. We are familiar with gravity B. It is the big gravity wave that holds the Earth as well as the rest of the planets in orbit around the Sun and holds the Moon as well as man-made satellites in orbit around the Earth. We are not familiar with gravity A. It is the small gravity wave which is the major contributory force that holds together the mass that makes up all protons and neutrons. Gravity A is what is currently being labeled as the strong nuclear force in mainstream physics, and gravity A is the wave that you need to access and amplify in it to enable you to cause space-time distortion for interstellar travel. 
To keep them straight, just remember that gravity A works on an atomic scale, and gravity B is the big gravity wave that works on a stellar or planetary level. However, don't mistake the size of these waves for their strength because gravity A is a much stronger force than gravity B. You can momentarily break the gravity B field of the Earth simply by jumping in the air. So this is not an intense gravitational field. Locating gravity A is no problem because it is found in the nucleus of every atom of all matter here on Earth and all matter anywhere else in our universe. However, accessing gravity A with the naturally occurring elements found on Earth is a big problem. Actually, I'm not aware of any way of accessing the gravity A wave using any Earth elements, whether naturally occurring or synthesized, and here's why. We've already learned that gravity A is the major force that holds together the mass that makes up protons and neutrons. This means the gravity A wave we are trying to access is virtually inaccessible as it is located within matter, or at least within the matter that we have here on Earth. However, the Earth is not representative of all matter within our universe. The residual matter which remains after the creation of a solar system is totally dependent on the contributing factors which were present during the creation of the solar system. This is true whether you believe that the origin of the universe was an evolutionary event or that a supreme being caused this event to happen. The two main factors which determine what residual matter remains after the creation of a solar system are the amount of electromagnetic energy and the amount of mass present during the solar system's creation. Our solar system has one star, which is our sun, but the majority of solar systems in our Milky Way galaxy are binary and multiple star systems. In fact, many single star systems have stars that are so large that our sun would appear to be a dwarf by comparison. Keeping all this in mind, it should be obvious that a large single star system, binary star system, or multiple star system would have had more of the prerequisite mass and electromagnetic energy present during their creations. This makes it possible for these systems to possess elements which are not native to the Earth. Scientists have long theorized that there are potential combinations of protons and neutrons which should provide stable elements with atomic numbers higher than any which appear in our periodic chart though none of these heavy elements occur naturally on Earth. 88 of the first 92 elements on the periodic chart occur naturally on Earth. Some heavier elements do occur in trace amounts, but for the most part, we synthesize these heavier elements in laboratories. Generally speaking, the stability of these synthesized heavy elements decreases as their atomic number increases. But experiments at the lab for heavy ion research in Germany have shown that this may only be true up to a certain point, as the half-life for element 109 is longer than that of element 108. The point is that our observations and theories are accurate. The fact is that heavier stable elements with higher atomic numbers which have more protons, neutrons, and electrons than any Earth elements do exist. However, up until this point in history, there has been no physical evidence to prove this. But now, that proof is here. The most important attribute of these heavier stable elements is that the gravity A wave is so abundant that it actually extends past the perimeter of the atom. These heavier stable elements literally have their own gravity A field around them in addition to the gravity B field that is native to all elements. No naturally occurring atoms on Earth have enough protons and neutrons for the cumulative gravity A wave to extend past the perimeter of the atom so you can access it. Even though the distance that the gravity A wave extends is infinitesimal, it is accessible and it has amplitude, wavelength, and frequency just like any other wave in the electromagnetic spectrum. Once you can access the gravity A wave, you can amplify it just like we amplify any other electromagnetic wave. To demonstrate how a wave is amplified, we can use this oscilloscope. And as you can see, it graphically depicts the tone you hear as a wave. As we amplify the tone, you can see that the size or the amplitude of the wave increases giving us a more powerful version of the same identical wave, and thus the tone sounds louder. In like manner, the gravity A wave is amplified and then focused on the desired destination to cause the space-time distortion required for space travel. This amplified gravity A wave is so powerful that the only naturally occurring source of gravity that could cause space-time to distort this much would be a black hole. This brings us back to our original question. How do you generate a gravitational field? You must have access to an element which is heavy enough 
for the gravity A wave to extend past the perimeter of the atom. Then you can access and amplify it for space-time distortion. To complete our three science lessons, the last question is, what is the power source for this type of travel? Well, for those of you with limited knowledge about power sources, I'm sure you can probably imagine the enormous amount of power required to cause a space-time distortion for this type of travel. After all, we're amplifying a wave that barely extends past the perimeter of an atom until it's large enough to distort vast amounts of space-time. For those of you with extensive knowledge about power sources, I'm sure it's probably even more puzzling as to how it's possible to have a compact, lightweight, onboard power source that can provide this much power. For everyone to understand that, I need to further explain a couple of things we briefly touched upon in the last question. If you remember, I said that for the most part, we synthesize or create heavier elements in accelerators and their stability decreases as their atomic number increases. So what does this all mean? Well, we synthesize these heavier, unstable elements by using more stable elements as targets in a particle accelerator. We then bombard the target element with various atomic and subatomic particles. At this point, transmutation occurs, making the target element a different, heavier element. This element now has a higher atomic number, as the atomic number simply indicates the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. So this is what I mean when I say their atomic number increases. What does their stability decreases mean? The length of time which an element exists before it decays determines its stability. Atoms of some elements decay faster than atoms of other elements, so the faster an element decays, the more unstable that element is considered to be. When an atom decays, it releases or radiates subatomic particles and energy, which is the radiation that a Geiger counter detects. As you can see, this Geiger counter is detecting the radiation from this uranium, which literally means that the Geiger counter is sensing the subatomic particles which are being released or radiated as the uranium decays. Those elements in which nuclear radiation can be consistently detected are radioactive elements. These heavy elements, which we synthesize in particle accelerators, are of the radioactive variety and they decay very rapidly. Since we're only able to make a few atoms of these elements, and because they decay so rapidly, we're not able to observe much about them. This is what I mean when I say their stability decreases. However, there are elements with higher atomic numbers which are stable, even though they don't occur naturally on Earth, and we can synthesize them in particle accelerators. These are the elements in the 114, 115 range, which don't appear on our periodic chart. Beyond element 115, the elements become unstable again, and in fact, element 116 decays in fractions of a second. This finally brings us to the power source. The power source is a reactor which uses this element 115 as its fuel. In this reactor, element 115 is used as a target and is bombarded with protons in a small particle accelerator. When a proton plugs into the nucleus of an atom of 115, it increases its atomic number and becomes an atom of element 116, which, remember, decays instantly. What element 116 releases as it decays, or what it radiates, is antimatter. What is antimatter? Antimatter is the exact counterpart of matter, which has a charge and a spin that is in the opposite of all matter. When combined with any matter in our universe, antimatter reacts and completely converts to energy. And remember, the rapid conversion of matter to energy is what we generally call an explosion. To demonstrate the explosive power of antimatter, let's pick a random area where an atomic bomb might explode. Oh, let's say Iraq. And for demonstration purposes, let's say an atomic bomb would explode, for instance, in, uh, oh, Baghdad. Well, if one of our older atomic bombs exploded in Baghdad, the area of total devastation, which is indicated by the red dot on the map, would be approximately two miles. This would be caused by a fission reaction in which less than 1% of the nuclear material is converted to energy. Most of you are familiar with the bombs that were dropped on Japan in World War II. This is the same bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, August 9, 1945. About this same time, Dr. Edward Teller, who's known as the father of the hydrogen bomb, figured out that a nuclear fusion bomb was possible. Fusion would release even more energy and cause an even bigger explosion from the same amount of nuclear material. Much to Dr. Teller's dismay, the Japanese surrendered, we never dropped the hydrogen bomb, and Dr. Teller's been in a bad mood ever since. 
But if a hydrogen bomb containing the same amount of nuclear material as the Nagasaki bomb were to explode in Baghdad, the area of total devastation would be approximately 20 miles. This would be caused by a nuclear fusion reaction, which again, less than 1% of the nuclear material actually converts to energy or explodes. The other 99% of the nuclear material on this type of bomb is dispersed, but is not involved in the actual nuclear fusion reaction. Now, if a bomb was made with the same amount of nuclear material as the Nagasaki bomb, and that material was antimatter, when that bomb exploded in Baghdad, the area of total devastation would include parts of Africa, Europe, and Asia, with the exact area of total devastation being very difficult to calculate. This would be caused by a total annihilation reaction, which is the complete conversion of matter to energy. A hundred percent of the nuclear material on this bomb would explode or convert to energy. We currently have no practical way to harness antimatter into a bomb, and generally speaking, we can only isolate antimatter in a particle accelerator and store it for a short time. This demonstrates the enormous amount of power released when you totally convert matter to energy, which is what happens when antimatter and matter are combined. So back to our power source. Inside the reactor, element 115 is bombarded with a proton, which plugs into the nucleus of the 115 atom and becomes element 116, which immediately decays and releases or radiates small amounts of antimatter. The antimatter is released in a vacuum into a tuned tube, which keeps it from reacting with the matter that surrounds it. It is then directed towards a gaseous matter target at the end of the tube. The matter and antimatter collide and annihilate, totally converting to energy. The heat from this reaction is converted into electrical energy in a near 100% efficient thermoelectric generator. This is a device that converts heat directly into electrical energy. Many of our satellites and space probes use thermoelectric generators, but their efficiency is very, very low. All of these actions and reactions inside of the reactor are orchestrated perfectly like a tiny little ballet. And in this manner, the reactor provides an enormous amount of power. So back to our original question. What is the power source that provides the power required for this type of travel? The power source is a reactor which uses element 115 as a fuel and uses a total annihilation reaction to provide the heat which it converts to energy, making it a compact, lightweight, efficient onboard power source. I've got a couple of quick comments about element 115 for those of you who are interested. By virtue of the way it's used in the reactor, it depletes very slowly and only 223 grams of 115, which is just under half a pound, can be utilized for a period of 20 to 30 years. Element 115's melting point is 1740 degrees Celsius. I need to state here that even though I had hands-on experience with element 115, I didn't melt any of it down and I didn't use any of it for 20 to 30 years to see if it depleted. So we've learned how space-time is distorted by a gravitational field. We've learned how that gravitational field is generated. And we've also learned where you get the power to accomplish all of this. Now it's time to link all we've learned in our science lessons to the vehicle that utilizes all of this technology. And a few years ago, I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but that vehicle is a disc, which is generally referred to as a flying saucer. I had at least partial views of the nine different discs out at Area S4, but the one I'm going to describe to you now is the one in which I not only saw two of the three interior levels, but I also saw it fully functional in flight. And no, unfortunately, I didn't get to go for a ride in it. This particular disc appeared to be in excellent condition and because of its sleek appearance, I nicknamed it the Sport Model. The Sport Model is about 16 feet tall and 40 feet in diameter. The exterior skin of the disc is metal, which is the color of unpolished stainless steel. The Sport Model sits on its belly when it's not energized. As you can see, the hatch is located on the upper half of the disc with just the bottom portion of the door wrapping around the center lip of the disc. The interior level of the disc is divided into three levels. The lower level is where the three gravity amplifiers and amplifier guides are located. These are the things used to amplify and focus the gravity A wave that we learned about in our science lessons. The reactor is located directly above the three gravity amplifiers on the center level and is in fact centered between them. The reactor is similar to this half scale model. The element 115 is machined into triangles like this and is then inserted into the reactor. This piece of element 115 is the source of the gravity A wave as well as the target that is bombarded with protons to release the antimatter, both of which we learned about in our science lessons. 
The center level of this disc also houses the control consoles and seats, both of which were too small and too low to the floor to be functional for adult human beings. The walls of the center level are all divided into archways. At one point in time, when the disc was energized, one of the archways became transparent and you could see the area outside of it just as if the archway was a window. After the panel had been transparent for a while, a form of writing, which was unlike any alphabetic, scientific, or mathematical symbols I've ever seen, began to appear on the transparent archway. And I was never informed as to how all of this was achieved, not that any of that would have required alien technology. I was never given access to the upper level of the disc, so I can't enlighten you as to what the porthole-like areas are, other than I can assure you that they're not portholes. Now before I go any further about the disc, I'm going to show you where and under what circumstances I saw it tested. My job in this program was to be part of a back engineering team. Back engineering is the act of taking a finished product and tearing it apart to find out what makes it tick. The goal in this program was to see if the technology of the disc could be duplicated with earth materials. When I went to work, I was flown from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas to Area 51, which is a highly secure government base on the Nevada test site. Area 51 is located about 125 miles north of Las Vegas near the Groom Mountains and the Groom Dry Lake Bed. From Area 51, I was bused to an even more highly secure facility located about 15 miles south of Area 51 called S4. S4 is situated at the base of the Papoose Mountains by the Papoose Dry Lake Bed. The airspace around S4 is restricted and if any unwelcome aircraft strays into the outer sector, they radio the pilot and instruct him or her to leave. If that pilot continues and strays into the middle sector, jets will be scrambled to escort the intruding aircraft out. If for any reason whatsoever that aircraft penetrates into the inside sector before jets can be airborne, ground-to-air missiles will neutralize the intruder. The moral of this story is don't try and fly into S-4. The S-4 installation is built into the mountain and the nine hangar doors are angled at about 60 degrees. These doors are covered with a sand textured coating to blend in with the side of the mountain and the desert floor. As you can see in this representation, my ID badge had a white background with one light blue and one dark blue diagonal stripe in the upper left hand corner. At the bottom of the badge, there were letters and numbers designating various areas including S4. On my badge, there was a star punch through S4. The back of the ID badge was dark blue with a vertical mag stripe running down one side. The hangar that housed the sport model was like a typical airplane hangar with the exception of the angled doors that I mentioned before. The hangar was equipped with typical tools and extensive electronic equipment. It also had a machine with an x-ray emblem on it and an overhead crane rated at 20,000 pounds. Equipment in this hangar was marked with a black number 41 with a white circle around it. It was outside of this hangar that I saw the sport model tested. Now, when the disk travels near another source of gravity, such as a planet or moon, it doesn't use the same mode of travel that we learned about in our science lessons. When a disk is near another source of gravity, like Earth, the gravity A wave, which propagates outward from the disk, is phase shifted into the gravity B wave, which propagates outward from the Earth, and this creates lift. The gravity amplifiers of the disk can be focused independently, and they are pulsed and do not stay on continuously. When all three of these amplifiers are being used for travel, they're in the delta configuration. And when only one is being used for travel, it's in the Omicron configuration. As the intensity of the gravitational field around the disk increases, the distortion of space-time around the disk also increases. And if you could see the space-time distortion, this is how it would look. As you can see, as the output of the gravitational field from the amplifiers becomes more intense, the form of space-time around the disk not only bends upward, but at maximum distortion actually folds over into almost a heart shape around the top of the disk. Now remember, this space-time distortion is taking place 360 degrees around the disk. So if you were looking at the disk from the top, the space-time distortion would be in the shape of a donut. When the gravitational field around the disk is so intense that the space-time distortion around the disk achieves maximum distortion and is folded up into this heart-shaped form, the disk can't be seen from any vantage point and for all practical purposes is invisible. All you could see would be the sky surrounding it. The program out at Area S4 consisted of three projects, Project Galileo, Project Sidekick, and Project Looking Glass. Project Galileo dealt with gravity propulsion and was the source of all the information you've learned in this first section. 
Project Sidekick dealt with a beam weapon that had a neutron source and was focused by a gravity lens. Project Looking Glass dealt with the physics of seeing back in time. Now, I was not personally involved with the hardware of Project Sidekick or Looking Glass, and those projects are beyond the scope of this video. So this brings us to the end of this first part, in which I'm presenting to you as fact. At this point, we begin our second part, which is the section that contains what I call excerpts from the government Bible. I call it that because, as you can tell from part one, there's a small segment of the United States government that makes scientific and technological judgments from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. If the following information is true, the United States government also makes judgments on a historical, philosophical, and even theological level from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. These are excerpts from some of that information. As part of my indoctrination into the program at S4, I would randomly be taken into a small room which contained a table, a chair, and 120 or so briefings in blue folders. I'd be left there to read for varying amounts of time, usually about half an hour. These briefings contained a wide spectrum of information, mostly relating to aliens and alien technology. These reports appeared to be an overview of alien information which can be used to brief scientists from any field about the scope of the whole project and not just their specific field of endeavor. The overview of Project Galileo was accurate. I read the overview and later witnessed evidence which proved it to be accurate. So it is possible that scientists involved with other projects could have seen evidence that these other overviews were also accurate, but I can't make that assertion. To me, these reports were simply words on paper. So to keep from saying allegedly and supposedly in every sentence, I'll relay this information to you as I read it, since I've already put this disclaimer on it. This technology that you've learned about thus far was brought here by some alien beings from the Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 star system. These stars are located in the constellation of Reticulum, which can only be seen from the southern hemisphere. Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system, which means it has two stars, and is located approximately 30 light years from Earth. These beings are from Reticulum 4, which is the fourth planet out from Zeta Reticuli 2. This is the way star systems were referred to in these reports. They simply designate the name of the star and the number of planets from the nearest to the furthest from the star. For instance, our sun was designated as Sol, and the Earth was referred to as Sol 3 because we're the third planet out from the sun. A day on Reticulum 4 is 90 Earth hours long. The beings are 3 to 4 feet tall and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. They have grayish skin and large heads with almond-shaped wraparound eyes. They have very slight nose, mouth, and ear positions and are hairless. Any dates in the information regarding these beings were written in a six-digit number which began with 1623. Since I had no idea what the six-digit number was for the present year, I had no way of calculating when these beings arrived, or at least arrived this time. These beings said that they had been visiting Earth for a long time and presented photographic evidence which they contended was over 10,000 years old. There was an exchange of hardware and information in central Nevada until 1979, at which time there was a conflict which brought the program to an abrupt halt. The beings left, but were to return at a 1623 date, and I don't know what that date is. With the remaining hardware and information, the U.S. government started the back engineering program. In May of 1987, some scientists took an antimatter reactor to an underground blast facility on the Nevada test site to perform an experiment. Unfortunately for them, their experiment required them to cut the reactor open, which resulted in their deaths. This explosion was explained to others at the test site as a previously unannounced low-yield underground nuke test. I was hired in December of 1988 to replace one of these men. These beings conveyed information about the capability of affecting the human brain to anesthetize the human body. This is done without any physical contact from a remote source. For this anesthesia to be accomplished, the brain has to be in a relaxed state similar to that required for hypnosis. If the brain is subject to any external stimulation like stimulant drugs or loud music, this manipulation of the nervous system is ineffective. These beings said that man was the product of externally corrected evolution. They said that man, as a species, had been genetically altered 65 times. They referred to humans as containers, yet I don't know what we're containers of. As I'm sure you now know, it was impossible for me to corroborate the information in the second section. And obviously, if this information is true, the ramifications are far-reaching, and you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to figure that out. So before I bring this to an end, there are a couple of questions I should address for you. The first one is, how did I get into this program? 
While working at Los Alamos National Lab in 1982, the local newspaper did a front page story on a jet car I had built. Coincidentally, Dr. Teller was giving a speech in Los Alamos that same day. We met and had a short chat about the jet car and I later listened to his speech. I never met Dr. Teller again, but in 1988 when I decided to re-enter the scientific community, I sent him a resume and inquired about a job. Dr. Teller responded by telephone and told me that he was no longer active, but just functioned in a consultant capacity. He gave me the name of a contact to call in Las Vegas. I made that call and things progressed from there until I got into the program. I never got a chance to ask Dr. Teller if he remembered me from Los Alamos, so I don't know if that was a factor or not. If you use nuclear fuel and not that possible, nuclear fuel is feasible. But whether these event velocities are feasible, which are interesting, if you ever want to get there, that stuff. That is an important question. And that is about all I can say. All I have time to say. And what specifically the fuel will be, I think it might be fission, more probably fusion. And it would come soon. Is there any other nuclear reaction besides fission and fusion that you know of? Is there anything such Look, please, you try to explore the things about which I only will have to tell you it is not interesting, it's a waste of time. Above plutonium or Look, it is, in my opinion, not interesting. I don't intend to answer it. If you ask me that question on camera, I will shut up. I will sit silent. You're not going to get an answer out of me on that. Okay. And if I ask you on camera if you know Bob Lazar, can you just say no? I will sit silently. The second question is, that if all I've just presented to you is true and the government is keeping this a secret, how can I make a video telling you about it? Well, the bottom line is, if there are any repercussions from making this video, it would simply confirm that what I told you is true. So what you do with this information is up to you. Remember, not everyone who sees a disk in the sky is crazy. So keep your eye on the sky, especially here in central Nevada. And thanks for listening. makes it interesting is they deny that it's there. Area 51 is unlike any other U.S. military base. Located deep in the Nevada desert, this top secret facility is surrounded by a wall of rugged, unforgiving mountains. Protected by an impenetrable ring of security that keeps the base beyond the reach of intruders and critics charge all government oversight. Reports of strange advanced aircraft suggest they may be testing anti-gravity propulsion, a revolutionary aviation system once reserved for science fiction. Chuck Clark may be the world's foremost authority on Area 51. As a professional astronomer and aviation hobbyist, he's always had a fascination with the base, which the U.S. military claims is simply an aircraft test site. In the remote Nevada desert, the tiny town of Rachel is the closest most people get to the high security base called Area 51. It trades on wild claims of UFOs, but many think the government encourages alien theorists to propagate myths about Area 51 in order to discredit legitimate watchdogs. Chuck Clark makes this his home base for watching and documenting any and all activity that comes from the base. Today, he's meeting with the team of experts he's assembled to spend 24 hours using any legal means for the most intensive in-the-field investigation ever launched into the true nature of this legendary base. Their mission to launch a 24-hour, round-the-clock, up-close investigation of Area 51 and discover what the government is hiding inside the walls of the world's most top secret military base. This is Area 51, guys. 
this is a satellite image of the base. Sort of gives us an overall view of what's out there. Each man brings with him a unique base of knowledge and skills. Guy Norris is an award-winning military aviation reporter. He's been studying top-secret airplanes and air bases his whole career. I think the, the interesting thing is from an FAA chart, but as you can see, there's absolutely no indication whatsoever of, of any runways at all on the map within that restricted area. So obviously on the map itself, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, there is no runway here, although quite obviously the, the reality is, is very different. Military communications specialist Bob Groves has been studying the base's radio system. There are several hundred frequencies active out here. I brought a scanner out, going to do some listening and see if, if these are really as active as they seem to be. Private detective Mike Johnson has already been on the case. The security measures are far more than just the remoteness and, and it's being so desolate and out in the middle of nowhere. And he knows that at any well high security outside, military base, security guards are well armed. And at Area security. 51, they are ready to use deadly force if anyone breaches the perimeter. To really observe the working of the base, they must split into two teams. All right. Team 1, Electronic Surveillance. Mike and Bob will circle the base's perimeter, checking out the elaborate security system up close. They'll try to watch the people who will be watching them, and using radio scanners, they will go beyond the barbed wire and guard houses to eavesdrop on Area 51. Team number 2, Visual Surveillance. Chuck will lead Guy to the top of Tikaboo Mountain. It's the only vantage point of the base that hasn't been taken over by the military. Chuck will aim his astronomical telescope not at the stars, but at Area 51. For Chuck, this trip is the most important of dozens he's made to photograph Area 51 and its operations. Ten years ago, Chuck retired to tiny Rachel, Nevada, so he could get a closer look at the military's latest airplanes. But the more Chuck peered beyond the walls of Area 51, the more he saw that the base was operating according to its own rules, under separate command, out of view, and above the law. Chuck discovered just how far Area 51 security reaches. One day, Chuck was hiking in the desert when he stumbled on what he thought was debris from a crashed airplane. I've been over to, you know, pick it up, pull it out of the, the sand to see what it was, and I saw the antenna sticking out of the ground. You know, so I cleaned it off. It was a transmitter that had a lead going off to a smaller plastic box that was a sensor. Chuck has uncovered a motion detector not along Area 51's secure buffer zone, but miles away from the perimeter of the secret base and on public land. To Chuck, the sensors are the latest in a series of covert moves designed to expand Area 51's ability to carefully monitor the movements of innocent civilians. It's a little overkill in my opinion. They have a uh, about a 25 mile buffer zone out here and it's all terrain like this. It gets rougher as you go. Why they have to put stuff outside the line, and really it escapes me. Uh, I, I found them uh, over in the, the next valley as far as uh, uh, eight miles outside the line and a mile from uh, Highway 375. Determined to expose the military scheme, Chuck enlists the help of award-winning investigative journalist George Knapp. It took us about half an hour to find the first sensor. Five minutes after that, we found the second one. See, there's your transmitter right there. And we'll come around here. And right here will be the time delay unit. And you'll see it's clearly marked U.S. government property. In all, the two men discover over a dozen sensors, all set up to transmit information back to Area 51. Retired astronomer and desert rat Chuck Clark keeps an eye on the top secret base known as Area 51. When George Knapp's story hits the air, Chuck is on the move. Chuck has discovered a way to breach the barbed wire and penetrate the ring of security to get inside Area 51 without getting arrested. 
but it means he has to travel 500 miles to Denver, Colorado. Inside this nondescript building is advanced technology originally developed by the military that runs Area 51. Now Chuck can turn the tables and get an insider's view of the secret base. Space Imaging is a company that owns and operates Iconis, the world's first commercial high-resolution satellite. Iconis circles the Earth every 98 minutes, beaming back aerial images so precise, it can even pick out the building that funds Area 51, the U.S. Capitol. So Chuck, what's your interest in Area 51? I moved out there about 10 years ago, and whenever I wasn't photographing the stars and the heavens, I pointed my big lenses at the base. Ooh, I'm sure they love that. Oh, they loved it. <laughs> Using the Icona's aerial photos, the team at Space Imaging is able to assemble an accurate 3D model of Area 51. The U.S. government may not like Chuck, but they can't stop Space Imaging from giving him his first real peek inside the ultra-secret base. Oh, boy. <laughs> This is Area 51, you know, built with our Iconis imagery, and then uh, we're able to fly through with this software. That's fantastic. I have photographs uh, that I've taken showing the fronts of these, but I've never seen this building. And I did notice you know, some sand on the runway, so I wasn't sure if there hadn't been something that had landed there recently, or maybe the aircraft began landing right about here. Maybe that dust is just painted on for a deception, too. Mm -hmm. I, you know, these, these are, you know, some nefarious people that are running this place and they might think of something like that. Yeah. Is this public information? I'm sort of, you know, little brother watching big brother. You watch mundane things long enough and you figure stuff out. The security as tight as all the rumors I've heard and what I've seen on TV? Well, it's probably tighter. The security has sensors that are set up miles outside the perimeter mm -hmm. and, and so they're out there watching you long before you get anywhere near the line. Whoa. I'm not going to disappear after this show. <laughs> Probably, but... Uh... In Denver, Chuck's mission is accomplished. He quickly hits the road again, determined to share his findings with the rest of his team. But while Chuck was getting his glimpse inside Area 51, the federal government was already striking back, as he's about to learn the hard way. I got a call from a friend of mine with the FBI who said, what the hell are you doing up at Area 51? Something heavy was going to come down real soon. Something bad for Chuck. In the remote Nevada desert, Area 51 is a secret military test site. It sits protected from prying eyes by a 25-mile buffer zone, mountains, and an inhospitable terrain. Two teams of investigators are on a stakeout, documenting everything they see and hear. If all goes as planned, and base security doesn't interfere, they'll reconnoiter 24 hours later. Team leader Chuck Clark and military aviation expert Guy Norris will set up camp on a mountaintop, armed with a telescope and camera. We seem to be well, completely in the middle of nowhere, so... We're 22 miles into the backcountry here. This is the easy part. They still face a two-hour climb up the sheer face of Tikaboo Peak. Wow, so that's how high then? Uh, that's around just a few feet below 8,000. We're, we're roughly at 7,000 right here. So we're really on our own out here, aren't we? Uh, yeah, you're on your own. You could be in a whole bunch of trouble up here if you, you know, broke a leg or something. Chuck Clark knows what trouble is. Since George Knapp's broadcast of Chuck's discovery that Area 51 security was hiding motion detectors outside its legal perimeter, the men in black decided to teach Chuck a lesson. While Chuck was immersed in space imaging's model of Area 51, the feds were swooping down on his desert home. FBI agents have confirmed that a search warrant was served last night on the home of a self-described military watchdog in the tiny town of Rachel, near the mysterious Area 51 military base. It's an exclusive story you will only see here. We've learned this action was initiated by the Joint Terrorism Task Force. The search warrant remains sealed, and the FBI won't say what was seized from the home of Rachel resident Chuck Clark. Well, I was just driving over to Dave's house, and I noticed that there was a whole bunch of guys standing around over at Chuck's. Bill Whiffen lives down the road from Chuck Clark and knew he was out of town. 
At first he thought Chuck was being robbed, so he grabbed his camera and started snapping. The men and women you see are members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. There was about 10 cars and uh, a lot more than 10 people there. I recognized the badges and I saw the FBI on the jacket. I got pictures of them making boxes, going in and out, and I got one of the uh, hard drives coming out. As Chuck returns to Rachel and his home, he has no idea what has happened. Let's see. Oh. Uh... Oh, that's weird. For Chuck, his work, his privacy, his security are all suddenly gone. He finds the warrant and an invoice of confiscated items waiting on the dining room table. It's district court search warrant and they've got their card. And I guess that's an inventory. Let's see here. U.S. District Court search warrant. Da, 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 da. Ooh, Nevada Joint Terrorism Task Force. Oh. That's impressive. Every inch of Chuck's place has been thoroughly searched. Basically, they took a whole whole list of stuff. The scanners, radios. They took six floppy disks, 15 CDs, uh, Area 51 photos, uh, film negatives, uh, two photo albums. They took the monitor. I don't know why the hell they take a monitor. Well, what information is in a monitor? Phone. Word spreads quickly. Calls come from friends and neighbors. Hello? Oh, I understand some feds visited my place while I was gone. No, I haven't been disappeared yet. That'll be tonight. <laughs> I'm doing things I know they don't want me to do, but I'm not doing anything illegal. You know, I think they resent the fact that we were starting to publicize their, their censors on public land. Now, the message they were trying to send to them was knock it off. I know what I can legally get away with, and I know what's, what I can't get away with. And I push it right to the, uh, the edge, but I don't go past that edge. And uh, that's what's got them so irritated, that I'm not intimidated by them. I, I get right in their face with the camera lens. Aware that the government is investigating Chuck, his other teammates, security expert Mike Johnson, and audio expert Bob Grove take up their part of the mission. They are just two miles from the rear entrance to Area 51, and they're certain that security can see them coming. There's several ways that they can sense, of course. I'd imagine they're listening to us right now. Well, it could be. <laughs> they're certainly watching us, but uh, yeah. I'd imagine they're listening pretty close. Fence line right up there. They decide to walk the fence line, keeping their eye on the guardhouse. Let's see what we've got down here. There's some type of sensing unit on that fence right there, that white box. Could be, could be. Take a look and see what that is. Security is well aware of them. That's far enough from me. Yeah, I'm, uh... let's check the other side of the road, see if there's anything there. From 100 yards away, they get their first glimpse of the private security force contracted to guard Area 51. Known to insiders as the Camo Dudes. So called because of their desert camouflage uniforms. Bob and Mike want a closer look, but they know one step over the line would put their mission in jeopardy. This is not the time to test the boundaries. I don't want to end up in jail. Yeah. Mike and Bob make a quick strategic retreat. Two crews of renegade researchers battle fatigue in the harsh desert environment as part of a 24-hour vigil to uncover the mystery of a place whose existence is still denied by the government. I should have been in training for this one. Well, uh... <laughs> Back on the mountain, Chuck and Guy make their way up the dangerous path to the summit of Tikaboo Peak, carrying a 50-pound telescope and gear for the cold night ahead. The first half mile here up, up to the first ridge is, is, is killer. It's uh, steep and loose. And it gets steeper as we get higher. Their destination, the only available view of Area 51. Well, here we are up top. Wow. 
That is so spectacular, isn't it? This... Well, what do you think? Is it worth the climb? <sighs> yeah, I mean, I'm finding it difficult to, to uh, describe to you, actually, what it's like. Um, I, I think the weird thing is that although we're here on planet Earth, you feel like you're on the edge of another world out there. Looking out across the desert through the heat haze, there is another world, one the government has tried to hide from prying eyes. It's Area 51. Yeah, I can see some buildings glinting sort of thing in the sun and I can make out one of the runways. Unbelievable. I can't believe I'm actually seeing it. It's unbelievable. After all this time, it's... It, it's incredible. It's not really a myth. Yeah, it really exists. Chuck and Guy hurry to make camp on the bare mountaintop. All too aware that if they can see the base from here, the base can see them. They're 26 miles away and must rely on Chuck's telescope and telephoto camera to let them spy on and document any activity at Area 51. With the eyepiece in place, it will give us about a 50 power look. Oh, yeah. Both men know Area 51 exists to test the ultra-secret new technology, technology right out of science fiction. In terms of what could be going on there, there's a, been a growing speculation that anti-gravity propulsion, this sort of so-called holy grail of aerospace, could be, uh, could be on the verge of becoming reality. There are quite a few stories about uh, things that seem to be anti-gravity, and I've seen a few things over the years also. Like what? Uh, objects that uh, rise slowly, uh, sort of hang motionless for minutes at a time, and then suddenly dart halfway across the sky in a second or two and stop instantly or make a high-speed V-turn. That's incredible, isn't it? You never know what you're going to see. They're, they're testing all sorts of things here. On the desert floor, disguised as campers, Bob Grove and Mike Johnson are setting up to monitor anything coming or going inside Area 51. They won't be able to see directly into Area 51, but Bob will be able to monitor any transmissions. If there is a, a presence of phenomena of any type, it can be measured in a physical sense, and there are a variety of test in instruments that can do that. For example, this little device, turn it on here, uh -huh. You hear that little chirping sound. This indicates that we have transmitters on, and you and I happen to know that we have because each of us is wearing one. It's our little wireless microphones. Right. With monitors set, Bob and Mike settle in for a long night of listening. At the top of Tikaboo Peak, team leader Chuck Clark and aviation reporter Guy Norris move the telescope into final position. When something happens, if something happens, they'll only have seconds to react. It's a moonless night tonight, right? So that's better for the chances, the potential chances of something happening. It increases the potential chances. Uh, they don't want a chance silhouetting against the moon, so uh, the, the less moon there is in a night, uh, the more likely they are to test. It's almost 2 a.m. Electronic specialist Bob Grove and security expert Mike Johnson are encamped just outside the base's border. Bob's high-tech radio equipment will monitor any ground or air activity at Area 51. And if I want to monitor that, we're particularly interested in looking for signals that pop up in this frequency range because this is a federal government range. One is in the 160 megahertz to 170 megahertz range. And then we go a little bit higher where military aircraft in the 225 to 400 megahertz range. What they hear is the actual sound of Area 51. Bob adjusts the frequency. What's that chatter that we're hearing there on the radio? That's uh, security. Okay. Talking about us? Could be. Mike and Bob suspect they're being monitored by Area 51 security. They will ride out the night waiting to see if they'll be hassled by the legendary security team. Yeah. 
Chuck and Guy can see lights appear. It seems to be operational, even at 3 a.m. In the years that I've been here, in the almost 10 years I've been here now, it's expanded quite a bit, probably doubled in size just in the last 10 years. Tonight, on the mountain peak and on the desert floor, the air has been strangely silent. Then, the steady static is interrupted. Bob struggles to keep the frequency in range. We have now a number of military um, aircraft, air-to-ground frequencies active, indicating they've got something in the air, as well as uh, ground control frequencies. That something is moving at an incredible speed, straight toward Guy and Chuck. We've just got a really bright light in the sky directly overhead the, uh, overhead the site. Did you see that? Oh boy. <laughs> it's still there. It um, seems to be moving to the north, but that was amazing. It was so bright, wasn't it? Yeah. It was directly over the, over the site. Too. Well, it, it makes me think it might have been an aircraft with a very directional light on it. Guy hopes for a second sighting so that Chuck's camera has a chance to catch it. But the sky suddenly goes quiet over Area 51. The runway goes dark. It's 5.30 a.m. As the dawn breaks, Chuck and Guy use the telescope to view the base one final time before the heat haze obscures the image. There's the control tower on the left of that little higher hill in the center. Yeah. yeah. You see the top uh, 20 feet of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. And it looks like the vehicles are uh, over on the left side of that uh, tax de taxi right now. For Mike and Bob on the desert below. Here it comes. 15,000 feet above their heads, Area 51 comes alive. Guy hears it too. It sounded like there was something in the air over there, Chuck. It could be a, a B-2 bomber. They uh, practice refueling around dawn and then stay in the airspace for a couple hours out here. Guy can't believe his luck. The B-2 is not alone and it has some surprising company. Oh, there's a MiG-29. Excellent. Okay, he's, gonna, he's turning that way. Although America is no longer in a cold war with the Soviets, for some strange reason, it's still fighting their aircraft here at Area 51. In the valley below, Mike and Bob suspect they have been watched all night by base security. They are ready to meet with Chuck and Guy, but have one last place on the map to check. Well, if I listen to Chuck correctly, the uh, main gate ought to be about 10 miles or less uh, off there toward that hill. As they close in on the official entrance, Mike is startled by something in the mirror. Barreling toward them is an enormous vehicle. With its windows painted black to protect or hide its passengers, it speeds toward a day's work at the top secret base. Holy smokes. The bus doesn't even slow down. I think the uh, bus is doing a little more than 45, maybe was, 145. He was hustling. He was. To prepare for this 24-hour vigil, Mike Johnson spent weeks on the strangest stakeout of his career. His target? an Area 51 employee who will talk for the first time about life on the base. It's mind-boggling uh, from my perspective as an investigator how well maintained the secrecy of this facility is. The first step, how many people work there and how do they get to the remote desert base? Area 51 is located 140 desolate miles north of Las Vegas. For years, it's been whispered that a secret airline shuttles hundreds of Area 51 employees every weekday from their homes near Las Vegas to their classified jobs on the base. The name? Janet Air. Legend has it that J-A-N-E-T stands for just another non-existent terminal. Whatever it's called, there's no doubt now that the airline is real.
Over here is the uh, McCarran International Airport, and the Janet Terminal is on the west edge of the airport property. This secret site is just a few blocks from the Las Vegas Strip. The only uh, indication of where you're at at all is the signs that say warning, secure facility, or no trespassing. There are no overt indications of, of what this facility is. It's uh, what we refer to as hiding in plain sight. During his stakeout, the first thing he notices is something that Janet airplanes don't have. There is no identifying markings on those aircraft with the exception of the tail number. All aircraft have a tail number um, with the exception of military aircraft, which would uh, indicate to me that they are privately held aircraft. Using his investigative skills to run down the tail number, Mike knows these planes are owned by EG&G, a huge government contractor. One of the Janet flights just loaded up, moved out onto the tarmac, and uh, should be taken off here any second. They typically don't leave them in the uh, holding pattern too terribly long. They get them out onto the active runway and get them out of here pretty lucky split. Every day, hundreds of men and women pass through these gates on their way to work at Area 51. We're seeing a car go in now. The guard just stepped out. Uh, this driver's going to display some form of identification. And uh, the guard's trying to figure out what I'm doing. And uh, he's watching me, watching him. Mike is on public property, but he still has reason to worry. The guard hasn't taken his eyes off Mike's car. I definitely got his attention. He knows I'm here. Here's a chance to check out the system security. But it could also lead to compromising the mission or jail. Here's the white uh, security pickup truck. Got the uh, Janet Terminal Security watching me. I've got uh, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department watching me. And uh, I'll be stunned if a marked or an unmarked unit doesn't come up and uh, try and ID me here in a second. The net gets tighter on the ground and in the air. Here, a helicopter overhead. The best way to continue the investigation is to get away fast and come back when things cool down. Time is running out, but Mike and Bob know they're close. I see uh, orange markers on the hillside there, and that's what Chuck uh, said delineated their boundary. When there's a some type of unit sitting up there and here's the boundary right here yeah there we are this is as far as i want to drive this humble stretch of road is one of the most secure spots on the planet some uh censoring units up there on the hill looks like it yeah the big one on top especially people who have crossed this line have been arrested interrogated stripped of cameras phones even their clothes no trespassing beyond this point photography of this area is prohibited well i think this is probably about it as far as i'm willing to go yeah of the hundreds of people who work at Area 51, why have none of them come forward with information? What kind of threat does the government hold over their heads? Mike's investigation has led to uncovering the addresses and backgrounds of people who park their cars in a secure Las Vegas air terminal and fly to the super secret base. Now it's time for him to take the next step and reach out. An unmarked black SUV pulls out of the gate. This could be the opportunity of a lifetime. I spent a couple days out here and I watched the activity. I was able to do some research uh, and find out the owner of the vehicle uh, is an employee of the test site. Mike is more determined than ever to track down someone who can unlock Area 51's mysteries from the inside. 
With Mike tailing close behind, the black car moves off the freeway. It's a promising turn of events. The further his target goes from the intimidating glare of base security, the more likely he is to talk. I don't have a clue what leverage the contractor or the uh, government uses, but man, they must sign their life away. It's phenomenal how well kept the secret is. Rush hour traffic slows the chase down, and for a moment, Mike loses sight of his target. The car I'm following is at least a quarter mile ahead of me right now. Mike manages to pick up the trail again. Now he weaves between vehicles, staying close enough to keep a constant watch on the black SUV, while being careful not to blow his cover. Our guy is still up in the number one lane. Let's see how lucky I can get. The chase moves from the freeway to city streets and begins to draw to a close in this slow-paced suburban neighborhood. These people are your average middle class, upper middle class folks. They're your next door neighbor, the parents of your children's best friend. They just happen to have a super secret job. We'll see what happens here and then go knock on the door. Do the answers to Mike's questions lie behind this door? What secrets will his hard work reveal? My name's Mike Johnson. I'm an investigator. You're not in any trouble whatsoever. But um, one of your vehicles has been seen uh, going in and out of the Janet Terminal. And we were hoping we could talk to you about uh, Area 51. No comment. And the door closed, and that was that. From the reaction, I'm pretty confident he works there, and uh, that's where we're at. He's not going to talk about it. The government's strict secrecy policies prove a formidable obstacle. But Mike's patient and more determined than ever to find someone who will talk to him. I am going to have to do some substantial digging to identify um, a disgruntled type employee that's willing to, to talk or, or even acknowledge uh, their, their participation with Area 51. <laughs> Back in Las Vegas, Mike Johnson's search for an Area 51 insider is picking up steam. A tip from an inside source has brought Mike to this nondescript hotel. If his information is correct, waiting upstairs to speak with him is a former employee of Area 51. I worked at Area 51 for approximately 14 years, and uh, through the 1980s and the early a part of uh, 1990s. Success. The man is apparently willing to talk, but only if his name is not used, his face hidden, and his voice disguised. Lives were put at risk, careers were jeopardized or, or terminated just to keep the nature of this uh, place secret. Mike spent hours and hours staking out Area 51's commuter airline, Janet Air. Here's someone who flew it five days a week. After you'd arrive at McCarran, you were to go park your vehicle, walk inside the terminal where you would uh, surrender your, your baggage to ensure that you weren't carrying any uh, tape recorders, cameras, uh, things of that nature. Mr. X confirms the accuracy of Chuck Clark's satellite 3D model. This is the base he worked on. That is absolutely correct. It's absolutely right. Mr. X says fear, more than anything, pervades every aspect of life and work on the base. Security for the personnel was far greater than uh, what you see on the outside. If you made a call home, you had to be very careful as to what you said to your wife or your children, as to, to divulge where you might be, uh, when you might be coming home, uh, what method of travel you might use. What sort of work warrants this kind of secrecy and security? It's a, a test facility for experimental aircraft. Okay. So what's that? The United States has some projects that are, are deemed classified for one reason or another, and they are uh, tested and proven at that particular location. 
but Mr. X says Area 51 is unlike any other Air Force base. Is an Air Force separate from, from the normal Air Force? Absolutely. Uh, and, and the attitude of the individuals up there is, yes, we are, we are not the regular Air Force. We are, we are somewhat uh, above the regular Air Force. He says those who run Area 51 regularly risk the lives of their own workers. Absolute power is true, corrupts absolutely. And these individuals up there are definitely operating, like, like the apocalypse now, operating without any decent human restraint. <laughs> they're, they are uh, they're on their own mission. Moreover, Mr. X says anyone who challenges that mission is dealt with swiftly. This individual uh, that I knew uh, expressed grave concerns over personnel being exposed to toxic chemicals, hazardous waste, if you will. He was told that the, basically the project was behind the curve. They needed to uh, expedite its completion, and that kind of information would be kept from those uh, personnel. And when he challenged that, he was uh, dismissed, removed from the base. Mr. X is well aware of the risks of talking, but he says that unless the truth comes out, corruption could very well destroy the base's very real military functions. I think there should be a congressional investigation of the place. Chuck and Guy, hungry, tired, and facing a tricky climb down a steep slope. They can't be sure that they've eluded base security until they're safely back at their rendezvous point. Sitting on a rise with a perfect view of Mike and Bob is a member of the Area 51 security force known as the Camo Dudes. They're not military, but a private police force assigned to keep everyone away from Area 51. Here's the deal. We are his excitement. There's a real life person in there um, really watching us, listening to us right now. He's probably laughing at me, uh, talking about him. Still a lot of activity on the uh, security channel. Well. We've seen just about all we're going to see here, and I'm not willing to go any further. Yeah, I don't think we should tempt fate. With security definitely alerted to their presence, they know it's time to leave and meet up with Guy and Chuck. Hey, guys. You guys as tired as we feel? Good <laughs> night. All right. See you. The team's investigation has proven Area 51 is fully operational. Radio came alive with getting ready for a mission. We had a, a, an excellent view of the base. It was incredible at that range, you know. If what Mr. X says is true, then men like Chuck Clark and his teammates may offer the best hope for reforming a military base where absolute secrecy is eroding the line between fact and fiction. We're the only superpower left, and yet secrecy at Area 51 has grown rather than decreased in the last couple of years. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why does the military cloak Area 51 in such a thick veil of secrecy? Is it to protect national security? Or does it merely provide cover for more nefarious activities? Either way, the government's not talking. But take a trip out to the desert, walk right up to Area 51's perimeter, and look headlong at the fence that's keeping you out. What Chuck or any of his cohorts will tell you straight up, if you want answers, the truth is in there.